Hello and welcome. This is Business Morning on Channels Television. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwag. The COVID-19 pandemic is threatening to roll back gains achieved in health and education over the past decade, especially in low-income countries, and that's according to the World Bank. In its Human Capital Index report for 2020, the president of the International Financial Institution, David Malpass, explains that investing in people, particularly in the health and education of children is vital to lay the foundation for sustainable, inclusive recoveries and future growth. He also says the World Bank is working closely with governments to develop long-term solutions to protect and invest in people during and after the pandemic. The Human Capital Index, which was first launched in 2018, is an international metric which serves as a benchmark for investment in human capital across the country. And the Central Bank of Nigeria has unveiled a 200 billion naira loan for the federal government's social housing program as part of the Economic Sustainability Plan 2020. The CBN said the initiative is to be implemented in collaboration with Family Homes Fund Limited, a sub-Saharan Africa's largest housing fund focused on affordable homes for Nigerians on low income. In a report, on the framework for the implementation, the CBN says funds will be released to FHF on project basis subject to the cumulative maximum limit of the amount. All right, joining me now to look at this issue of mass housing is a professor of housing and urban, re urban regeneration at the University of Lagos, Professor Timothy Nubi. Thank you very much, Professor Nubi, for finding time to be on this show today. Thank you for having me. Now, part of the federal government's economic uh, recovery plan, of course, is to deliver mass housing. And now the central bank is um, coming up with this fund, 200 uh, billion naira to uh, you know, put into uh, that project. As an expert, what's your take on it? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good news for us. Uh, I mean, this, uh, this kind of the day when we got the news yesterday, we said we, we, when I got the news uh, this week, I said well, this is one of the days that the Lord has made because uh, uh, my own area of uh, research, as far back as uh, 2006, uh, I was able to find out that uh, the critical in the value chain, in the housing delivery value chain, that uh, no longer land, but funding is uh, happened to be the most critical uh, aspect or point in the value chain. And uh, we've been advocating and pushing for this large sum intervention uh, since 2006, 2007. So it's a welcome development. It's a welcome development. And uh, the, the fear of government all along has been where do we domicile this funding and uh, which structure we can appropriately run it. Uh, now we're seeing that no. um, they're they are talking about family homes, family funds, homes. that's where it's going that's to right. be domiciled. Right. Then one would wonder what happens to the federal mortgage? Oh, well, I, actually, I, I wish we get that. Um, whew, very wonderful question. Family homes is new. Family home, as, as I know it today, is headed by one of the experts across the globe, uh, Mr. Femi Adewale, who has huge experience in UK for almost 22 years before he became the, he was the immediate past MD of Shetar Free. He has handled huge portfolio in the past and he has projects across the world. Yes, so. That's actually my confidence that this money will not go down the drain. And Family Homes Fund is not a charitable organization. So when they use the social housing, the social housing connection is what government is still missing out. Uh, family homes can offer social housing, but they will deliver houses. They will deliver affordable housing, but they can't handle social housing. So it's right time government understand that. But the, the, the most important thing to me is starting somewhere. It's starting somewhere. So FMBN, I, like, I, I, I put it down here. It's like, you know, in 1977, FMBN was re-engineered and repositioned 
without proper diagnosis. Just for that, for that uh, for, uh, since it started in the early 60s. By the time it got to 1976, FMBN could no longer give loan out. They ran out of, uh, they, they ran out of capital. And they couldn't give loan to people that were demanding mortgage loan in this country. So government just look at it that time, okay, what is it that you're not doing well? And they just say, okay, we give, we give you 20 million naira, as far back as 1977, to, to, to give to people. But that's not the way. The way of mortgage is that people must save. FNBN should have, they would have looked at what happened, what went wrong, and they would have addressed it. Like you go to a medical doctor, you would diagnose you, you would carry out some tests that you didn't do. They just gave FNBN 20 million to reposition them. Okay, you couldn't meet your demand, take money. That's not the way to look at problem, to solve problem. And over time, 20 million, they spent the 20 million and all effort. What government should have done, what government should have done is, let us look at FMBA. Because it's key that a, a, an institution came and we are saying all the resources, we are dispensing the resources through them alone. And like you rightly asked, what happens to FMBN? Why are they not involved? Because FMBN has social inclination. You know, mm -hmm. the, the essence, if they could key to the National Housing Fund, they were the one that can really give social housing. housing. No. But I know that, uh, well, uh, that's as I say, housing is, I kept on saying here on this platform, that housing is a system. And we have to design that system. This interventionist approach, whereby we just say, okay, FMBN, uh, F F family homes is doing well, and uh, let's just give the money to them. Uh, we, 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 if we want success, if we want robust housing delivery in this country, we have to interrogate the value chain and see the players and see how do we reposition them for better performance. I think that's the word I can say for now. Right. Talking about, um, you know, social housing, yeah. mass housing. Now, I know house. that, yes, and affordability, yeah. that's very key. Now, we know that the management of urban growth, yeah. you know, has been a kind of a major concern, yeah. you know, to government, especially in develop, uh, uh, developing e economies. Now, in, in Nigeria, for instance, urban migration has seen a lot of growth yeah. of slums, yeah. particularly in, uh, here in, in, Lagos. in Lagos. Now, I, I remember when this coronavirus um, started you were on the show and yeah. we talked about yeah. this now looking at what the government is now trying to do yeah. how do you think this can deal even with we, the we, issues of the slums yeah you see it, it, it will not it will not uh but working closely with uh family homes we can really drill down so that this most Nigerians will benefit. Family homes has a particular structure. There are people that were demanding, state government that wanted to embark upon home construction, they've been approaching them. And uh, they've been doing well across the country. There's no doubt about that. But what we are talking about is that we must develop a sustainable system. Not there is fire brigade. This is a fire brigade approach. But so when you talk about sustainable system, what sus are you suggesting? Yeah, a sustainable system is a system that carries everyone. You see, the slum, the slum we are talking about, how will, the, how will the program now benefit that category of people? So we must tell the state government that will benefit from this now. Family homes must be able to tell them that when you are bringing your project for funding. Include in your project projects that deals with slum upgrading, like Elijah Shomulu. If you are bringing new builds, also bring projects that is up upgrading. You know, because we said, we've said it many for us, that there are so many houses in this country, Ebutemeta, Shomulu, Karu, that they were at completion stage, 
there must be part of this funding given to people to do their roofing and move to their houses. There must be part of this funding given to people to do minor repair. And that's where your area called regeneration. Regeneration comes in. Mm -hmm. Because if we are saying that this money will go to new builds only, there's no way slum upgrading and uh, home improvement could benefit. But it's now the responsibility of the leadership of family homes to say, look, in order to have national spread and to have every Nigerian benefiting from this, not all Nigerians need money to do, to lay foundation. Mm -hmm. There are so many people that have built their houses to a certain stage and they got stopped. They just needed a fraction of what a new home requires to put the, 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 the stock into the market. So there are some people, there are so many houses at the like I kept on saying, that have roofs already. The houses have leaking roof, and they don't have the capacity to repair. So this loan, fraction of it, percentage of it, should go to such. That's the only way we can remedy this. So it's not just about um, building new Newly. houses? Newly, no, no, no. Absolutely. No, well, the, building, the, the government hopes that this um, scheme, uh, this yes. initiative will create about... 1.5 uh, uh, million jobs, jobs in yeah. five years. Yeah. What do you see, or what do you think is the nexus between social economic development and housing? How realistic do you see yes, this job yes, creation? Yes. You know, I was, uh, you know, if uh, you come from the part of the country where I come from, I come from uh, Ogun State, Jebu part of Ogun State, there is a message we call Ekpa. Ekpa can do anything. If you have snake bite, they will rob it. It's gone. Mm. If you have rashes, it's gone. You see, it does everything. And I kept on, in the last 20 years, I've been telling this government that housing is a part of of national economy. Housing solves the problem. If any government should focus on housing, if any government, when we were in, when I was in FHA, we were to start these four million housing, two million housing units within four years. We were to start the first year with uh, 100,000 housing units, with 10,000 housing units. And we calculated that 360 million blocks will be required. You can imagine the industry that surrounds molding of blocks alone. Not to talk of those who will create the hinges, the doors, which they try to highlight. Yeah. It's more than that. The multiplier effect is even more than the 1.5 million that is written in this uh, pronouncement. Yeah. Of a, it's more than that. Now, yes, it's more than uh, that. You, you know, the program designed to at least uh, utilize about 90% of locally Local. manufactured uh, uh, products. Just uh, wondering, uh, do we have the capacity? We, we, don't, we don't have that. That's, mm. those, are, those are wishful uh, thinking, but uh, we will eventually get there. Once we begin to say something, uh, there is consciousness around it. As of today, I want to assure you that more than 60% of building materials are imported. More than 60%. That's according to Mwedapo, 2002. Uh, uh, and it has not changed. The iron, the glasses. But it's, you know, that's why I'm saying that this funding, probably there will be another layer of funding for that to build the capacity of local building materials developers, uh, uh, producers, so that we can really consume. Because why are we importing, why are we importing glasses? When glass is made from sand? Why are we importing ceramic? When we have, we used to have it at Abelkuta. So this is the way to really, this is the time to really look inward and say, look, this manfa local manufacturing industry that have gone into coma, how do we give them tax-free holiday? How do we encourage them? What are the incentives that we need to give so that they come about? If not, the 90% building material is not, is not done. It's not, it's not attainable. The roofing material, the tiles, everything, they were saying imported. Mm. The washing basin, WCs, they were saying imported. So this 90% that they're saying, it's a wishful thinking. It's a desire. But we are not there. We are not there in the next Now, looking yeah. at, um, I mean, 
countries, let's even use countries within yes. uh, West Africa here. Are there models you think the federal government can actually replicate when we talk about social, social housing, because that's what they are driving at, social housing, mass housing. Are there, uh, there are models uh, you think we can replicate to deliver uh, mass housing? Yeah, there are, you see, housing is a local issue. Like I kept on saying, this word social housing is popular in UK, in America. You cannot, you, where 80% of the populace can consume housing from the market, 80% of British, uh, British uh, uh, of UK today, they will procure their houses through mortgage. Mm -hmm. They work in, they get mortgage, and they move to their houses. The remaining 20% that cannot operate in the market, those are the people that government will take care of. That's social housing. Social housing works where 80% of the population are economically active. But in Nigeria, 90% of our population are dependent. So there is no way social housing could work because well, the remaining you talk 20%. About, even when you talk about the mortgage, there, yes. there's issue of interest rate. Yes. Yeah, everything, like, that's why I said earlier on that housing is a system. The interest rate is high because the supply is lower than demand. Whenever there is demand, when the demand is higher than the supply, mm. definitely the price will definitely go up. And I kept on saying that the only way that can make Mogi to work in this country is to do, is to commoditize housing. When we commoditize housing and houses are produced on large scale, then the cost will drop. We have to know that. That's the first point. When, house, when the price of housing that we are buying today, 5 million, 20 million, becomes 1.2 million, then I, you and I can afford it. But as long as the cost of construction is this high, cost of labor is high, cost of material is high, because now cost of cement just went up. Iron increased with 20,000 last week. And we are talking of uh, affordable housing, social housing, when building materials kept on rising. And why are they rising? They are rising to reflect the exchange rate. Mm. Because most of these things were imported. Iron, we woke up last week, and a ton of iron moved from 235,000 to 255,000. 20,000 difference in a day. So, because it reflects the reality of the economy, we are, we are, we are import-dependent economy. Absolutely. And so, there's no way that most of the, and we are saying that more than 60% are import-dependent. So, the housing price will keep on rising. The only way to bring it down is to mass produce. When we mass produce, the price will come down. When the price comes down, you and I can afford mortgage. It's, it's a chain reaction. And it's a shame process that we must understand. Housing is a value chain. Housing is a system. Government must understand it. This is better than doing nothing. Uh, mm. About four months ago, government came up with 300,000 housing. And this is a follow-up that we, we are committed to this. So it's within the industry, we that are stakeholders, that will quickly put our heads together. That this money that is now domiciled with FMB, FM, uh, Federal family, family, family homes, homes mm. funds. How do we maximize it? And I believe that uh, I kept on telling our generation that few years ago, the operators of these sectors, they are older people. But mm. those of us that have been shouting that let's do it well, let's do it well. Femi Adewale was one of them, 2006. So he's now in position. The head of the FNBA, they are the particular generation. If we can't lock themselves inside the room and look for integrated approach to resolve this problem, then Nigeria will be in a fix. But I believe that it's a welcome development that we should just embrace. And we'll continue to push forward. We'll continue to push <laughs> we forward. have to start from somewhere. Yes, and that's, uh, that's eventually, that's hopefully, we'll get yeah, it we'll right. Get there, so we'll there. get there. Right. We'll Thank get there. you very much, uh, Professor, for Thank you so uh, coming much on for our show. Me. Thank professor so Timothy Novi is a professor of housing and urban regeneration at the University of Lagos. We'll take a break and when we come back, we'll talk commodities. Do stay with us.
And on commodities market update, I'm being joined by Nosike Nwajide, one of the research analysts with Financial Derivatives Company. Good morning, Nosike. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Chimese. Well, we'll start off from the global oil market. OPEC, of course, is meeting uh, today. And um, we've seen the price of oil in the downward trajectory, Brent, um, coming down in the past couple of weeks. Will this be a catalyst you know, for OPEC to review its current quarter? Um, well, I think, yes, it would be one of the reasons, one of the, the key considerations in OPEC, at the OPEC meeting today. Uh, OPEC earlier in the week uh, released their monthly market report, and uh, for the second consecutive month, they've uh, lowered the projection or estimate for global oil demand. So at this point in time where they are lowering or easing um, cuts to output uh, from 9.7 in, in August to 7.7 in September, they would probably sit down and weigh, weigh things. Okay, the, the global demand picture is dimming and supply, we are increasing supply. It's, that's, that's not the tactic we want to use at this moment. And the markets are, the markets are keen on OPEC's response to, to the seeming supply glut in the market. Um, OPEC would, be, would do very well to come out with a, a, a united front. We would come out with a statement at the end saying that, look, we, we would hold on easing production cuts and we would also ensure that, ensure very high levels of compliance, especially to the chronic defaulters like Nigeria, the Iraqs. And well, even, Nigeria yes. is said to have complied, uh, you know, uh, this time. So yes. either way the meeting, uh, you know, goes today, what would that mean for the country? Um, for Nigeria, okay, we've, we've deemed to have complied. Um, we, initially, we cheated on our OPEC out, output, so we've been giving or been punished with compensatory cuts, if you will, Nigeria is supposed to, uh, supply lower than its quota of 1.4 million barrels a day. Um, that give, it's for September and October, and would by by November. But November these days, no. November is it's it's more like a I say a long term outlook, giving the events in the oil market. So by mm. by November, hopefully, the compliance levels OPEC as a whole, mm. yeah, the market will read at the end of today's meeting. The market will say, okay, OPEC have. Um, OPEC and it's the big, the, the big players in OPEC, the Saudi Arabia's, the UAE's. UAE was reported, reportedly um, supplying 20% more than its quota. And by the time the markets are seeing that these OPEC members are intent on complying with their agreed quotas and also not cutting, not, uh, not easing output cuts as they plan to, with, I think oil prices would, in the next couple of months, rise back to the mid-40s. May not get to 50 uh, like it did pre-pandemic, but at least the mid-40s. Now, you, 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 you have on your born in economic issue as um, Nigeria oil production recovering by 0.74% in August. Is this uptake in domestic oil production still within the OPEC oh, yes, uh, it is. output cut? Oh, 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 yes, it is. At this, at this point, uh, Nigeria, Nigeria is a, I wouldn't say a fringe player, but it's not, it's not a powerhouse in, in OPEC. So you can't be going against, um, I say, instructions or di the directives of OPEC at this point. I mean, it's um, oil production. Nigeria is more sensitive to production than to price, the oil price level. So um, now that we are, we have basically com complied to quota, the reduction in oil output, uh, the impact on external reserves and the currency as well. But in the ne next couple of months, that constraint should ease. All right, the U.S. Um, Federal Reserve uh, yesterday left its interest rate um, unchanged and we've seen the dollar, you know, rally across uh, markets since then. What is the direct impact uh, of this on the foreign exchange, uh, Nigeria's foreign exchange market? What will happen to the Naira? Okay, um, we've seen the global economy has been awash with liquidity since the Fed lowered its interest rate to near zero. And that's, it's just, it's just committed to keeping interest rates at near zero for the next three years or even more. Um, it's hoping to have gets to maximum, infl maximum employment and an average inflation target of about 2%. That could take longer than three years. So we expect the global economy to be awash with liquidity. And if you have um, the capital flow reversals we had, or they were sparked uh, as soon as the pandemic hit, hit the emerging markets in Nigeria and um, the vol currency volatility and the outflow of FPIs, that should reverse, there should be um, global investors should maybe take, if we have some stability with the currency, if we could get our, um, the reforms as the World Bank um, induced reforms on the currency, we should have some 
increased inflows to bolster the currency. Then also, if you have, a, in the long term, in the next year or so, we should have a, a lower interest rate in, in the US will lead to a weaker dollar. I mean, the, the market would have reacted and the dollar strengthening, but over the longer term, it should lead to a weak, weaker dollar. A weaker dollar has a positive impact on commodity prices, which is good for oil prices and even cocoa prices at Nigeria is the biggest one. And we've well. even seen the external reserve creep up um, currently at about $35 billion. Where is the accretion coming from? I think, in my opinion, that's, that's a blip. I mean, because it's the... the, the Depletion, the trend right, right now is a depletion until we get increased um, accretion from, say, a World Bank loan, where they're still in talks, a 1.5 billion World Bank loan, and we have increased oil production and increased oil prices as well. Then we can see a significant, we will have significant impact, impact on the trend and we'll see it trend higher, close to 37 billion. Now let's look at um, agri export. Cocoa is Nigeria's major agri export, and we've seen you know, heavy rains, causing flood, and analysts say uh, this will definitely have some kind of impact on Nigerian cocoa. So how much damage do you think this um, heavy rain would have on Nigerian cocoa, and how would that impact um, revenue? Okay, um, the rains, the heavy rains have been isolated in the southwest part of Nigeria. The southwest accounts for about 70% of Nigeria's cocoa output. On the one hand, the excessive rainfall now, it's not just heavy rains, it's excessive for cocoa thrives, um, doesn't thrive under excessive moisture. Uh, so if you have this much rainfall and this mo much moisture, dry, when you harvest the cocoa, because this is harvest season, if you harvest the cocoa, drying it becomes a problem because of a lack of sunshine. Um, in addition, there's a, there's, a cocoa, there's a black pod disease that thrives under extreme moisture, which we have now. So as, as much as 40% of the entire cocoa output is under threat. So you have those two factors weighing on cocoa, cocoa supply. Cocoa accounts is our biggest um, agri export and it could diminish cocoa output by as much as 40% and have Nigeria's um, foreign exchange receipts from cocoa. And we have to, uh, top cocoa growers, Ivory Coast and Ghana, having hiked uh, farmers' pay and, of course, put mm -hmm. new uh, uh, floor price yes. you know, to it. What would that mean for uh, us? The new floor price is about 2,600 uh, uh, $2,600 per metric, metric ton, ton. Yeah. Uh, and the premium is $400, which they want to pay to the farmers. I think the global markets, has, they've come to terms with the fact that the, the um, Ivory Coast and Ghana are the two biggest players in the market, accounting for 65% of global output. If you have those two players coming together and you know, working together in harmony and cohesion to affect the global market, market you resign to feel that, okay, yes, what, whatever they will plan to do and execute will have an impact. It's good for other cocoa Supplies. Nigeria, is, Nigeria accounts for just 3% of the global market. Obviously, cocoa prices should rise in the longer term. Right now, we, we're seeing the effect of dampened demand as uh, consumers' pockets are hit. There's cocoa demand. Um, cocoa demand has fallen because chocolate demand has fallen. When the longer term, as the global economy recovers, we should see increased cocoa demand, which should incentivize increased cocoa supply. So, in the end, for a country like Nigeria, we have, still have impediments to cocoa planting, there's the inadequate financing, there's yield per hectare, that's still a problem. But all in all, if we can get, you know, we hear that the federal government has, uh, in a way, incentivized agri production by uh, wanting to, uh, directing the CBN to yeah. increase um, credit to agriculture. To agriculture yeah. Yeah, so if we could de-risk the sector, increase credit to agriculture, to increase output and pr productivity, and over time, because cocoa is a, from the point of planting to the point of harvesting, it takes it, takes a, it could take up to four or five years. So that is something that you do. It's a medium-term outlook. But if we can do that, it solves. Um, you stop, you save on Forex, you diversify the economy, you, there's jobs. And um, in, in the, in the end... It also help bring down the inflation numbers. Yes, food inflation. Mm, uh, food security, mm. food inflation, and then food sufficiency. It's the point that Nigeria can become an, a net exporter of agri-commodities in general. Let's hope that yeah. happens. Anyway, since uh, the inflation uh, report uh, was released on Tuesday, we have seen uh, the stock market in the red. Is it that investors are expecting the Monetary Policy Committee to perhaps increase the interest rate next week? Yes. Typically, when there's a hike, when inflation jumps up the way it did, it spiked uh, by 40 basis points the way it is, you expect the Monetary Policy Committee to respond with uh, hiking interest rates. And if you hike interest rates, it's not... You think not, they will want to do that I, at this I, I, time? I, the, the market is, from the market reaction, is that's mm. what it's seeming like. But it's, it's unlikely. 
it's unlikely that the MP MPC will respond, given the, the problems with GDP growth and unemployment as well. You want to do as much as you can to stimulate the economy. So that is, heavy, is weighing on the stock market performance, as well as um, stocks being marked down for dividend at this point. So those two factors are the major major factors driving the stock markets at this point. All right, let's look at the commodities uh, price movement. You talked about new yam price resistant to harvest effect. How so? Uh, the harvest effect typically is an increase in supply. Mm -hmm. Increase in supply which should drive down prices. But right now we're seeing that there's an increase in demand as the economy opens up. Now we have some constraints in the planting season, constraints to planting, constraints to, you know, because of movement restrictions and all of that. So you can only harvest what you plant. So you had... You had output that was already hit, you know, taking a hit. Then you have an increased supply, at, um, increased demand at this point because you know institutional demand is on the rise as hotels and restaurants and institutions open up. So that increased demand is outweighing supply. So that's what's driving. It's driving up um, yam prices. Now, when you look at the week, how would you describe the domestic um, commodities market space and what is your outlook? Um, we're seeing a rise in prices. We're seeing, mm. and it goes back to what I said. The, the domestic demand, institutional demand, and as schools open, as businesses return, there's increased demand and supply isn't matching that demand. So until that, until we get that equilibrium or balance in the market, mm. we'll continue to see prices trend up, trend up. And even as we enter the festive season, as we, this is September, as we get to October, November, you have increased demand and that will drive prices up. That's it. All right, thank you very much, Nosiki, for your time. Always my pleasure. Nosiki Mwajide is one of the research analysts with financial derivatives company. In the meantime, oil prices were mixed in early trade today, uh, just clinging to overnight gains as concerns about weak fuel demand were in the frame again after Hurricane Sally blasted through the Gulf of Mexico into the southeastern United States. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures were flat at $40.16 a barrel after jumping 4.9% on Wednesday. Brent crude futures gained $0.05 cents to $42.27 a barrel after climbing 4.2% on Wednesday. Prices were mostly in negative ground in early trade after a bigger than expected rise in U.S. distillate stockpiles, which include diesel and heating oil, raised alarm about fuel demand in the world's biggest economy. A panel of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies, together known as OPEC Plus, meets today to review the market, but is unlikely to recommend further cuts to oil output despite the recent price drop. OPEC Plus agreed in July to cut output by 7.7 .7 million barrels per day, or about 8% of global demand from August through December. Iraq and others agreed to pump below their quotas in September to compensate for overproduction earlier this year. Okay, let's do a review of yesterday's trading at the equities market and see what the outlook is like. Uh, for today and uh, the rest of the week. Temple will do that. Yes, thank you, Chimeze. Great to know that yesterday, again, the markets remained around uh, negative territory, uh, which is not so, so good. But of course, we know that we still have uh, the signs of the bulls in the markets. That's the great thing to notice in the markets. Decline of 0.19% yesterday in the market. Uh, that implies some 1.2 billion naira shift off the equity capitalization of the exchange. Uh, in spite of the fact that, yes, we got a negative market break again. Now, volume of transaction, we saw a 14% decline here yesterday. Uh, if you price in the uh, 30.3 million units of FCMB, 18.6 million units of UBA, which was down by 3.3% actually. And of course, uh, some 21 million units of Access Bank all down yesterday. You get this 211.81 million units of shares traded yesterday. Uh, and of course, you can now price in other aspects of the market or other counters transaction on other counters that also accounted for a total of this number. Uh, look at the value of transaction. MTN alone accounted for 1.1 billion Naira of the entire whopping 2.41 billion Naira that you have in the value of the entire market yesterday. And of course, Zenith Bank, some 300 and something million Naira. Then you have 113 million Naira worth of transactions on one of the other uh, key companies that you have right there in the market. Eventually, it was only the deals aspect of the market that was in green. Uh, but then look at the sectoral performance. Banking stocks were down. Of course, 1.2% decline in, uh, or 1.16% de decline in Zenith Bank, uh, which represents some sort of profit taking actually. 
Then you have a 3.3% decline or thereabouts in UBA. And of course, uh, 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 a lot of all the banks that you have there, especially the tier one banks, were all in the negative territory yesterday, except for GT Bank. And GT Bank was about the only company uh, that blazed the trail yesterday and defied the uh, markdown of the Cobalt dividend that was being uh, carried out on that particular company yesterday because the qualification date was the day before, and that was on uh, a Tuesday. So we know that yesterday, uh, GT Bank, which was the only tier one bank, that was positive yesterday was up by 40 basis points. Uh, X the dividend, uh, 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 interim dividend uh, figure, which is 30 Kobo, it fell back to uh, uh, 24 Naira 95 Kobo. And that's after also gaining some 40 basis points yesterday. Uh, but for a lot of the other banks, ETI was down, uh, Jai's Bank, all the major banks that you have there were down. Consumer goods side of the market, Vitafoom was positive, around 1.8% or thereabout. Then you have Nigerian breweries, which is also positive by 2.1% and gave you a marginal rise of 0.07% eventually. Look at the industrial side of the market. It was one of the major contributors to the decline that we had in the market yesterday. Negative by some 23 business points yesterday. No thanks to the WAPCO, but of course we know that it was the 3.4% uh, decline that we have in that space on the share price of WAPCO. Uh, that represents some profit staking eventually. Uh, then in spite of a 7% gain that you had also on Julius Bagada that is working on the Lagos about an express way right there. Insurance space, uh, Royal Exchange was down by 10%, NEM insurance by 9%, and of course, ICO, which is carrying out a rights issue at this point, was also down by some merging yesterday. All those puts together gave you about 1.5%. Oil and gas space was positive, mildly positive yesterday, 0.41%. Add over PLC, woke up again to 11 Naira 40 Kobo after gaining some 0.44%. Uh, percent that's 40, uh, 44 business points. Uh, transaction a little above 100,000 units of shares traded across this counter yesterday. Then O and Do also jumped yesterday by some 4.44 percent. I mean, this has actually exited the uh, overbought, uh, uh, the, the, the region where uh, the region of losses as we've seen in recent time in the market. So 500,000 units of his shares, 500,000, 593 units actually were traded yesterday in the market. Seplats had moved the day before, so no movement yesterday. And of course, that remained unchanged. All the other major gainers that you have or major companies that you have in this space has actually rested, especially Eterna PLC, which is now at 2 Naira 68 Kobo, but it's still way below the year-to-date performance of uh, 200, 2 Naira, it is something cover because it's about uh, way before now. Some, sometimes last year it was actually trending around 2 Naira, it is something cover, but it is yet to actually touch that particular uh, uh, region. Uh, about now. Capital Oil, Rack Unity, these companies remain the same way they have been. But we know that the, generally the uh, all share index of the market has now uh, remained uh, at the relative strength index of about 14 day period at this point in time. And so analysts are hoping that from today we'll begin to see some kind of uh, re entry, some sort of uh, portfolio rebalancing, and that will bring about some bargain hunting for folks to then get back into the market. But then again, the one that you have to be cautious because, again, you have to be sure of the kind of stocks that you're trading on at the end of the day so you don't get into uh, losses. And so folks are currently looking at the shares of GT Bank, of course, in spite of the uh, ex-dividend dates of, uh, of yesterday. Uh, folks still went ahead to buy some shares of, uh, of, of uh, GT Bank and, of course, they went ahead to buy uh, a little bit of Zenith Bank because, again, today, Zenith Bank should be back down. So folks that have actually bought at some 15 Naira, 16 Naira plus and were waiting for it to cross the support level of 17 Naira and then it went ahead to 17 Naira, that is something uh, cobble eventually, they had to sell down, except for the fact that you want to wait for the uh, share or for the, for the dividend, interim dividend of 30 Kobo, then you multiply that by the number of units of shares that you have in the market. Shimeze, I don't know if you're actually <laughs> going to be participating in the interim dividend that will be coming off these tier one banks. No, 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 no. <laughs> but one interesting thing that you said there, you're very optimistic that the bulls are still in the market. Absolutely. I mean, let's the just spirit hope of the, the bull roars <laughs> today. It is. All right, let's see what's happening out there in London with Juliana. Good morning, Juliana. A beautiful day to you. Chancellor Rishi Sunak hints at new measures to protect employment after announcing follow scheme closure. He plans to use creative ways to keep people in jobs. Wondering, what creative ways is he talking about? 
Well, it's a good question, uh, Chimase. We're not certain just yet, but uh, we know that uh, there have been several individuals that have been giving uh, the Chancellor various options. Yesterday, during Prime Minister's questions, Prime Minister Boris Johnson made it absolutely clear that uh, the furlough scheme, uh, the jobs uh, retention scheme or the subsidy scheme will indeed be coming to an end at the end of October. But we know so far uh, that the government does have plans um, from the 1st of November. One of those plans are the job retention bonus scheme. So with every employee that an employer brings back, uh, they will be receiving a £1,000 bonus. There's also that £2 billion kickstart scheme uh, for training uh, for the youth aged between 16 to 24. Now, earlier in the week, the influential Treasury Select Committee of MPs did suggest to the Chancellor that perhaps uh, they should extend the furlough scheme uh, to uh, heavily affected areas like hospitality. There are some hospitality um, uh, business uh, leaders that suggest 900,000 jobs are at risk. We know this is very similar um, in retail. I believe over 150,000 jobs have gone in the retail sector and in the airline industry as well. We've seen uh, that this is possible because it, there are piloted schemes um, available taking place in Germany and in France. So we're expecting that that could potentially be one of them. There are other um, uh, areas of interest. Business rates. Business rates has been a major uh, concern for lots of individuals. We know that business rates have been on hold or they have been on holidays for some. There are suggestions that that could be pushed forward. Uh, public sector hiring. Uh, Boris Johnson has been urged to uh, boost the private sector and allow flexible hours so people can work from home, people can work part time and balance that between their childcare. And also as well, with this um, kickstart scheme, there have been um, uh, calls for the government to expand it and not just allow it to be for the 16 to 20 four-year-old age group. We do know, uh, given the information we received on unemployment figures from the Office for National Statistics, that the young age group is uh, the main uh, uh, casualty of uh, the, the result of job losses, but older uh, people are also uh, majorly affected and it may be difficult for them to reskill re -skill or skill up, as uh, they say here in this country. Uh, so there are calls that they should put £1 billion into this kickstart scheme to expand it so it isn't just for the use. It'd be interesting to see next week whether the Chancellor accepts any of these calls. We'll see what happens. In the meantime, John Lewis is working on plans for a massive reduction in the size of its London flagship store, converting entire floors into office for online business. Is this another way to reduce the number of staff? Uh, clearly, it is a new way, and we know that uh, the retail scheme in the high street, the retail uh, scene, um, has changed dramatically. It was already changing uh, before uh, COVID, but of course, COVID has put an extra blow to that. Just before I came into the studio, actually, John Lewis and partners did release um, their uh, f their takeover for the six months to July, and sales have fallen 10%. Uh, Sharon White, she's the head of um, uh, John Lewis and partners. She predicts that in Waitrose, which is the grocer underneath John Lewis, their sales are going to be down 5% this year, and they expect a 35% fall in John Lewis sales. But yeah, going back to that story, it's a pretty significant story. John Lewis's flagship store here on Oxford Street, it's actually been here since 1868, which is extraordinary. Uh, they have seeked permission from Westminster Council to convert a couple of their floors, I believe the third and fourth and fifth floors, which at the moment houses homeware, toys, books, and other accessories. Uh, they want to see if they can convert that to office space. I believe the approval has been um, given, but this, again, would be a massive blow to the high street. It would be a massive blow to the West End. A lot of tourists that come into London love coming into West End. They love coming into Oxford Street. They love going into those big department stores, but those big department stores are empty at the moment. But I believe that one of the challenges that John Lewis will have is, is anybody going to want these office space? At the moment, we know people are comfortable working working from home, the big tech companies, the big banks, they're happy uh, for their, their staff to work from home until at least the end of this year. So will anybody want that office space? But at the moment, mm. John Lewis feel this is the only profitable way to keep them going uh, by sh shutting out uh, that space and renting it to office. It'll be interesting to see how this story develops. Mm. And looking across the Atlantic, the Federal Reserve yesterday said they expect to keep interest rates uh, near zero for at least the next three years. 
Are the London markets reacting to that statement by Fed? Yeah, well, the Fed's um, uh, statements came after after hours, after the markets had closed uh, yesterday. But it appears as if um, the sentiment that's hidden traders here in the UK is domestic policy. The Bank of England MPC are meeting today. They are going to be discussing interest rates. We're not expecting interest rates to fall below the already historic low of 0.1%. Quantitative easing stands at uh, 745 billion pounds. We're not expecting that to increase, but who knows? It's still possible. It's 2020, right? Uh, so the FTSE uh, fell quite sharply this morning, down by 1%. The FTSE 250, the domestic market, that was down by about 0.6%. The pound is currently trading 0.1% down against the dollar. Worth mentioning as well, big talk here in the UK about a second national lockdown. We're starting to see these local lockdowns are increasing as the time goes on. Uh, Matt Hancock, the House Secretary, is going to announce later today that uh, huge swathes of the northeast of England affecting millions of people will be locked down. The infection rate is steadily climbing. And there was a rumour from Chris Whitty, who is the public um, uh, health officer in England, uh, that he is recommending a two-week lockdown for the entirety of this country to try and, uh, you know, reduce the number of infections. So local lockdown is a major, major concern for traders in London today, Jimmy. Yeah, and hopefully when you speak with BC later in the day, you'll be able to give us update on the BOE's uh, meeting. And back here are the debt and currency market. Temple. Absolutely. Quickly, we talk about the unlisted securities side of the market where we saw some uh, profits taken again yesterday, but we still have the market capitalization at 530 billion naira. That's how we jumped to yesterday. But then look at the volume of transactions, 812,166 million, uh, 166 units, not a million, but just 812,000 plus yesterday. Uh, what 500,000 units of these actually went to CSCS, uh, which actually closed lower eventually. They had opened higher at 13 naira uh, for something couple, but then closed lower below uh, that, that level eventually. Then Afriland also experienced some kind of uh, uh, profits taken again yesterday. It was up in the morning. It opened actually at one naira forty-four or forty-six kobo, and then closed lower at one naira uh, uh, something uh, kobo. Eventually, then you have one call accounting for some uh, four hundred or six hundred units, and then you have NDEP. The major companies that you have in that space actually accounted for what you have there. And in total, we had just nine deals yesterday, all for eight point one seven million naira. Eventually, the bond side of the market yesterday, folks continue to react to, uh, negatively to the fact that inflation. Uh, numbers continue to rise, uh, 13 points, uh, 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 something percent eventually. So that has actually been driving the performance of this of this space. Uh, we have Ajike Taiwo uh, quickly to talk to us now from FSDH Merchant Bank. Ajike, you're an FX trader. Uh, talk us through the fact that, yes, we're expecting some kind of, I think, a retail auction today. Uh, how much of impact is that likely to have on the FX space? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, we're not having a retail auction today. Okay, so um, we had a retail auction last week. Okay. Um, we're expecting uh, the retail auction results tomorrow, and we ex and that's what's happening in the market. Okay, so at the end of the day, we've been seeing pressures in the in the, on, the, on the naira. Actually, what's your outlook for the day? For the day, I don't expect anything um, major to change to what we've um, been seeing. All the parameters remain the same, so I expect the day to trade flat. All right, Ajika Taiwo, thank you for your uh, analysis. I appreciate it. Ajika Taiwo is an FX trader with uh, FSDH Merchant Bank. Chimuze, it's back to you. Thank you, Temple. And on that note, we draw the curtain on today's edition of the program. Thank you for being part of it. I'm Chimuze Obi. Iwabu.